And there's certainly a theme of sensitivity around emotions. And often in the space between uh, the emotions and uh, kind of the headspace of one and the headspace of another. We saw this uh, earlier, uh, I would say a number of Mishnahis ago um, about uh, both trying to understand the complexities of when, when good things happen to bad people and vice versa, uh, and also uh, a certain amount of, of sensitivity uh, to those around us. So we're going to continue with the mission today. I think I clicked the wrong. I clicked the wrong one here. Uh, so this will just uh, bear with me. We'll do this quickly. I'm sorry, it wasn't set up from before. Um, you want to hear a joke? Uh, so, <laughs> do you, <laughs> so I have, uh, if you haven't heard this one, I could use a good there. Okay, so. Um, Rashi, the medieval commentator who comments on this mission, on these Mishnayas, and uh, his wife are going to go on a date. So it's date night. Rashi's, you know, sitting and learning while uh... <laughs> I told this over this way. My wife told me I, had to, I have to say it over differently. But uh, OK, so uh, uh, Rashi and his wife uh, are going to go to a lecture and uh, Rashi, uh, uh, Rashi's wife is sitting and learning and Rashi keeps, uh, let's say, taking his time. And, uh, you know, his wife says something on the, uh, in learning and uh, Rashi says, no, you shouldn't learn like this. You should learn like this. And uh, he then, you know, uh, she says, you know, how does this look for the lecture? And, and Rashi says, well, I think it's too formal. She changes. It's too casual. Doesn't match the shoes and the purse. Finally, she says to Rashi, you know, why do you have to comment on everything? So, because he's a commentator. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. We are, it's not even, all right. You guys it's are, cute. <laughs> it's cute. Everyone can say it in their own, uh, in their own way. Rabbi, can we hear Wendy tell the joke now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for those of you who don't know Wendy, she does everything better than I do. She's smarter. <laughs> she's certainly funnier. Uh, she can learn better. Okay. So uh, we are here uh, with Shmuel HaKatan. So Shmuel HaKatan um, certainly comes after um, the, this verse of, uh, from Proverbs, right? Proverbs is written by King Solomon. And so what's super fascinating about this Mishnah is that this Mishnah is not a teaching of Shmuel HaKatan. This Mishnah is Shmuel HaKatan quoting a verse in, in Proverbs, but we already have Proverbs and Proverbs is itself a book of Proverbs. So it, it exists as, a, as, its own, as its own work. It's very strange. And I don't know if there's another Mishnah that does this. Um, so so uh, this is what it says in the verse. Uh, in the fall, al tismach al Pen So if your enemy falls, do not exult. If they trip, don't let your heart rejoice, lest God see it and be displeased and avert God's wrath from them. So I think the, the most obvious kind of connection to Shmuel HaKatan is that this was relevant for his time. It was relevant for his time, both in relationship to Rome. Um, and I think it's really tricky. And just to, to speak about this, you know, I try not to be too political, but right the day after the election, Many people were happy and many people were not happy. Um, you know, and in um, Joe Biden's uh, acceptance speech, he said, look, I, I know that people, some people are really disappointed and are in pain. I, I know what it's like to lose an election. I've lost twice. And that moment of saying, I see you, I understand what that feels like, I was there. It, it was a graceful move. It was a really, really graceful move. Um, because sometimes we win and sometimes we lose, nobody wins them all. And the way in which we would want people to respond to us, if we happen to be in a place uh, of not being on top, is the way that we should respond to people when they're not on top. Because if we think about this world as uh, not a, like if I'm up, they're down, uh, but rather it's like we're all here to try to bring God close to this world to come, you know, to bring uh, ourselves closer to God. We're not on different teams. As human beings, we can't be on different teams. We're, there's one planet here. There's one kind of global ocean. There's, we're all breathing on some level uh, the same air, some degree. 
Um, and so I think part of this is in recognizing that there's often truth on both sides. And um, the only way to really try to get there is to be able to be in conversation, to be able uh, to make compromises. You know, some of the best advice uh, I got uh, from my from Rabbi many years ago was like in relationships, it's not important to be right. It's, right? <laughs> it's, it's important to be smart about it because you can be right in the moment and do wrong right in the relationship. So there's, uh, there's a certain, I think, kind of sensitivity that, um, that 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 a win for another, right? If it if it's if it advances the cause, is actually a win for everybody. Um, and so I think part of this is in relationship to Rome and the cycle of. It does happen to be that there are a couple of examples where the Talmud says uh, compares kind of like to the sun rising and the sunset. Like the sun can never be in more than one place, um, and the sun and the moon, right? They they have different kind of. Uh, they occupy different spaces. And so like, for example, Jacob and Esau is like a model that the Gemara says, uh, if one is winning, the other one is losing. Like there it actually is like a space that can't be co-occupied. And we do have uh, teachings about like real evil that those who uh, love God hate evil and that's real. But a, a person who sees things differently than we do politically, um, you know, I use, I'm from the South. I grew up around guns. I don't have a gun, uh, but I think reasonable people can can see uh, gun legislation differently if both people, both sides, are committed to right. We want to have gun safety, and we can argue about like what makes street safers around guns. Um, but if somebody, you know, and what's really great now is like the NRA is like, it's kind of like imploding, which as somebody who grew up when they were so powerful doesn't does give me a little bit of joy. I know we're talking about the mission that you shouldn't rejoice when your enemies fall. And I think part of that is that is that it actually takes work. Meaning I don't think the mission is saying don't gloat publicly, like don't put in the effort to like gloat um, just to rub it into somebody else's face. I think there's a deeper message here, which is that, you know, when you hear that like your opposition has fallen, uh, those are still people. And um, I'll share an example. Um, and, and it's relevant to the work and, and, and also to the complexity. Um, one of the most vocal, uh, most of the vo one of the most vocal uh, proponents of conversion therapy in this country uh, is a rabbi doctor. He's a therapist, um, and he did conversion therapy and for on other people. And he was kind of one of the religious leaders and certainly one of the practitioners that supported this as science that you could convert somebody outside of being gay. And as we the and we know that the, the people generally who are like the most homophobic often have their own kind of homosexual identities that they've suppressed. And it happens to be, I've known this guy for over 35 years. And his kids and I uh, are the same age. Uh, I'm friendly with his son-in-law and I went to yeshiva. His daughter and I were in the same class in elementary school. And maybe it was two years ago, he uh, got busted on the internet trolling uh, for men. Uh, he was he's married to a woman. He's vehemently anti. Uh, he's vehemently homophobic, and he had posted pictures of himself uh, in like not not good ways, uh, looking for men. It was all very graphic, um, and it was clear from the way in which he posted it that like this wasn't his first time, and it made national news. And there was a part of me that was really happy because conversion therapy is traumatic and horrific and illegal in most places and and all of those things. And so therefore the perpetrators of those things uh, should also like be criminalized and, and all the things. And this is a human being who like had his own demons of not being, of being so, of being part of a culture that was so homophobic that he could never even come out as being gay. And he's judged by God and, and for all of his actions and inactions, but he's also a wife and he, his kids are lovely people, not nearly as homophobic as he is. Um, and I reached out to him. I reached out to him. I, I sent him an email and I said, listen, I, I, I can't imagine what you're going through, right? To be on national news as, you know, uh, being outed. Um, and like, if you want to talk, if the things that I can do to be supportive, because there is space, I believe, uh, to be able to separate out the human piece uh, from the fight that like, I'm really happy that you're not going to be doing this anymore. There's no part of me that's conflicted, right? The fact that he is no longer doing this and the fact that he was made as an example and not him for him but that the person who was in charge of this was found out to be gay and uh 
I think it helps advance the cause tremendously. But there's still a piece, like no part of me was happy that his wife is reading this, that his kids are reading this, that his grandkids are reading this. Like it's a horrible thing for a person to have to go through. Um, so I think what the Mishnah here is saying is that even though a person might naturally feel like this is fantastic, those who are in opposition are, are suffering. Suffering is not something that we would ever wish on ourselves. Um, and so that, like, there should be some sort of sensitivity. And again, I think reasonable people could disagree with me and say like, if somebody's involved in things, uh, we shouldn't be compassionate. But I think there's space to hold uh, a certain amount of compassion that people are the way they are. And it could be that if this rabbi was, you know, had more confidence or wasn't you know, raised with such homophobia surrounding him, he might've been able to be an ally. He might've been able to be, um, he didn't respond. Um, his son-in-law responded to me and, and we, we schmoozed a little bit, but um, I, I just think that um, there's a, uh, just a natural desire to put people in categories of good or bad. It's a good person, this is a bad person. We are all complex beings. We all have things that we can prove. We all have things to be really proud of. Um, and it's hard to know if we were in somebody else's situation, how we might act. And um, so anyways, that's, that's the, the so, so I think part of this historically is a function of, uh, of the conflict with Rome and trying to recognize uh, the world is a cycle, right? There was a temple, it was destroyed. There was another temple, right? It was destroyed. There will be another temple. So part of the the recognition of cycles, I think provides a certain humility that, that like it could be today a person's in a good space, but at some point a person wasn't, some point in the future, unfortunately, it's likely a person won't be again. So part of it, I think is a recognition that, you know, not just that like what comes around goes around, but that like the world has a cycle, it's a circle and there will be ups and downs. We can weather the down when we know that there'll be an up on the other side, uh, which I think is really helpful to think about that, that this type of intense pain generally doesn't, uh, is not permanent. Um, and, um, and also there's a way in which, um, and this is what the first thing that I thought of when I read the Mishnah earlier today, you know, there's this great story that I'm sure we've quoted at the beginning of Brachos with Rabbi Meir and his wife. And, uh, you know, he's being like tormented by these hoodlums in the neighborhood. And he comes home. He's like, that's it. I'm just going to pray that they shall die. And his wife says, you know, maybe you should pray that they should repent. And, you know, part of, I think what happens, uh, and so like he listens to her and, and they repent. And I think part of what happens when we refuse to be in conversation with people, and again, not every person needs to, someone Jews for Jesus person reached out to me and said, I, I appreciate it, but I'm not, it's like not my lane. Um, so we don't have to have conversations with, with every person who wants to have a conversation with us. But the fact that somebody sees the world differently, I, it's not a reason. I think just the opposite. Uh, the Gemara says about a chavrusa, uh, somebody had their learning partner and they passed away. And he said, like, what is my life worth? Right. This person, you know, sharpened me by by arguing with me. They saw it differently in it and it made me a better person. So I think I think part of the teaching is that we make people into enemies who are not there. Are, we have enemies in the world. There are people who are doing really horrific things and there are people who just are doing different things. Um, and I think the space of enemy we've expanded. Um, and I don't think that it's good for the world. All right. I'm open and, and would love to hear people's thoughts. You can push back. It's a safe space. Um, any, I can put the, I can put the, yeah, please. Just unmute yourself, yeah. So Hi. Rabbi, when, when you reach out to somebody and they don't respond, you know, as you reached out to this person, how do you deal with that? Because, you know, to me, it feels like a rejection and I wanna get past that. But yeah. it's very hard. Yeah, I mean, the truth is, I, uh, I don't, I don't take most of this personally. I don't take the, you know, the the letters that I get from people thanking me. Um, I try not to let them get to me. In which I, the, the equal number of letters, uh, maybe it's not equal. Uh, people that you know are, are really displeased with me. Um, you know, we're never as good as the way which people I think see us, and we're never as bad either. I think for the most part. Sometimes they're exceptions. I think if we think about this work as, as we're doing this because we believe in the work, then we do it whether it's noticed or not, whether it's appreciated or not. Um, it is frustrating. It's, I would say I'm frustrated more than I ever get angry. Um, I do get frustrated a lot. Um, I don't know. I think we do the work because I, I, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a good uh, kind of scriptural support to this idea 
the short of it is, you know, we, we try to do our part. We're not responsible for, for, for working, meaning we do the best that we can. That's the obligation. It's not my responsibility to fix the world. It's just that I'm not allowed to, to not invest in trying to fix it. Like I'm obligated to do my part. If I'm successful or not, I don't actually think is up to me. Um, I mean, look, I can tell you, I was the same person essentially that I am now three years ago. Uh, three years ago, I was working in a deli in Lakewood, New Jersey and, uh, you know, writing and because I got fired from my job at Columbia. And, and um, you know, I think back to those times where, you know, so, so like I didn't have the agency, I didn't have the, the platform that I think I now have because of, uh, because of CBST and, and RSK. Um, so why now is, is it working when then it wasn't working? Because that wasn't the right time for it, right? I wasn't a different person. I wasn't, it was like, we all have the experiences we need to have. And, you know, we're all meant to be kind of tools of the almighty when God says, you know, there's, a, here's a decent proof text. Uh, there's a verse in Tehillim, it's in Davening. It says, um, there are many thoughts in a person's heart. Uh, that, uh, but God's kind of advice or God's uh, plan is what is uh, comes to fruition. So one interpretation is that God uses the evil thoughts of people, right, as a tool to orchestrate what God wants to happen in reality, right? So we, God is the master of the universe and God has all of us as, as uh, as 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 instruments, if we're lucky, we're an instrument. Um, if we're not lucky, we get used, right? We want to be a tool in the best way. So we show up, we do the thing. If God says, okay, so today's the day that this is going to be successful, this is going to be this is going to work. So then we're meritorious that it, that it's that it's us that gets to do this. Um, but we all know people who had the same ideas at different times and they didn't make millions of dollars. And the same person later has the idea and they have billions of dollars. So. There's, there's a lot that's not in our control. And I think for me, uh, I'm like acutely aware of how little control and impact I really have because so much is like, I don't want this world. I want a very, very different world. If it was up to me, it would be a very, very different world already. So the fact that it's not means that like, I'm actually not that impactful. I'm actually not that powerful. So I, I try to put in the effort because I think that's the only thing we can do. God, God can't hold us accountable for why it didn't work. Because we say, God, that's not my job. I did what I was supposed to do. I put in the effort. It didn't work because that's your problem, right? I, I did what I could do. If there was something else I could do, I would have done it. So I think realizing, you know, the limitations, uh, both can help in terms of not having the disappointment that comes from the space between that and expectations. Because if we do it because it's the right thing to do, then we don't have an expectation for anything else to happen. Um, you know, we can be optimistic. We can be hopeful. But um, I, I, I think a lot about... Um, doing the thing and like letting go of it. Um, if it's meant to reach the right people, it does. I, I deeply believe that people end up where they, they want to end up. And all I want to do is like be a resource for those who are looking. You know, when people, you know, want to get into it, I, I'm like, I'm not deeply invested in trying to, to proselytize, uh, you know, to try to convert people. If they don't believe in, you know, in LGBT rights or equality, like, okay, a person thinks the world's flat. It's also not my job, like, okay. We're not going to go on a cruise together. That's also okay. Like, I, in other words, I mean, like, okay, like you, you say the things that you think a person who's open to hearing the things can hear. And, uh, you know, if at, at the end of a conversation, we're like, I have nothing else intelligent to say to you. Like, if, if what I said didn't make an impact, so then I have nothing else that's going to be impactful. Okay, so we tried. Maybe the next person will be, you know, like maybe I, you know, took off a, le a layer of lever. Anyway, so I, I, I wish I had something better better advice oh, Rabbi, that was very helpful seriously oh. sure well i'm really glad see i tried and 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 we were we were meritorious today yes yeah, yeah, thank you of course rabbi i hope you know that i really have appreciated learning from you and continue to but there's one thing that you just said that troubles me sure and it's we hear so much or those of us or myself i'm trying to get a better picture on how especially the Chabad can lose so many people and continue to not wear masks and to believe it's a conspiracy, all of these things. And I read over and over that they believe it's all God's plan. And so that's what it's going to be. Yeah. And, you know, and I feel, I don't think there's anything wrong with your working at the deli in Lakewood. 
But if you had been doing this for a few more years, so many more people would be helped. And my God believes that that's what needs to be done. And so I just have a little trouble with this God's plan that I heard come from your sure. mouth. Sir, I can, I can try to refine it. So I, I believe that God has a plan. And, and simultaneously, I believe that, that the one thing that God does not control is our free will. Like that's the one thing that we're in control. And uh, that's what our rabbis tell us. Everything's in the hands of heaven, except for the way in which we interact with heaven. Like that is completely on us. The, somebody, this is not my original idea, but I think it's powerful, right? It's the same people who claim uh, that God runs the world and they don't need to have a mask because if they die from Corona, that was the divine will. Those are the same people that say they need to bring assault weapons, right, to Walmart because you never know, right? You never know when someone might have a gun. Well, if, if it's God's will for you to get shot, right, why are you bringing the, the assault rifle? So I, I think there's, there's just like, it's like a false narrative, meaning if you really believe that God runs the world, right, there's the famous story with a person who's drowning and, you know, praise to God and the so we believe that we have to put in the effort, right? That th deeply, like ours is a religion of action. Judaism is a religion of action. Uh, Aaron was a lover of peace and he was a pursuer of peace. So, I, I mean, I've written about this um, um, uh, in a few places. Um, it's heresy. Like, I don't know how to say it. Like, it's blasphemy to say that God doesn't want you to wear a mask. It's, it's beyond the insanity piece. It, 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 it's blasphemy, right? The Torah in all sorts of places, Maimonides writes about it. Everybody, it's the one thing that all rabbis have, have agreed on is that we are responsible uh, to take care of ourselves and not just take care of ourselves, take care of somebody else. And somebody else's physical well being is our spiritual obligation. And it's like, it's the most unambiguous part of the entire Torah, right? The entire Talmud is filled with rabbis arguing. And here it's only arguing to what degree does a person have to like, desecrate the Sabbath in order to, right, there's a dispute between the Babylonian Talmud and the, and the Palestinian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud. Uh, if somebody has to ask the rabbi on Shabbos, is it okay to desecrate the Sabbath to save someone's life? One Talmud says that it's like, it's murderous. And the other one like says it, it's, it's like the most revolting thing. So there's like an argument on how horrific it is. And, the, and, the, and, the, the, and what's interesting about it is that the responsibility uh, for the failure is on the rabbi, that the rabbi didn't make it clear that the person even needed to ask. Meaning the Talmud says the rabbi is a murderous rabbi if there was any sort of doubt in his community that the thing to do was not save the person's life. That the fact that they even had to ask the rabbi is an indicator that the rabbi failed. So like there's no ambiguity and Maimonides writes that, Maimonides uses this word of, of, uh, of a heretic, that it's a heretic who tries to, to put in opposition uh, religious freedom with um, uh, with uh, with any sort of danger to, to physical well being. It's it's in the, it's either the second chapter to the third law of Shabbos or it's the third chapter in the second law. It's two three or three two. Sometimes I mix up the numbers. Um, but um, but anyway, so uh, when we talk about God's plan, right? Um, there's a spectrum of mainstream rabbinic thought of of how uh, how involved is God in like the minutia of it all. So I'm on one end of the spectrum that I don't believe that any blade of grass blows in the wind unless God divinely orchestrated it. The others say, no, God created this thing called nature. You know, we've polluted the earth. And so as a result, the interest, you know, there are things that like God's not micromanaging. And that is just an extension of these are the consequences of our own free will. So I believe that uh, we sell ourselves short in how much free will we have, meaning how, how often do we think that what we're about to choose is actually a choice? I think that everything is a choice. That meaning in a very narrow space, there's a, a choice that brings us either further or closer away from God. So uh, the stuff with Chabad is horrific. The stuff with any sort of uh, religion that claims that you don't have to put in the effort because God will take care of us, that, that's, not, that's, not a, that's not a religion that, that Judaism could coexist, meaning theologically with, because uh, we're in this world to, to do the stuff. So I hope that, that, so when I think about, so when I, when I mean God's plan, um, I don't mean, you know, there are things that are beyond their control. The things that are beyond their control are God's plan. The things which are in our uh, purview of, of choice are significant. Hope that that helps a little bit. Ben, I know that you had your hand up. I know that you're probably uncomfortable speaking about this, but if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, during that period of time, when you were doing something that was not your calling, or we don't mm -hmm. think it was your calling, what was going through your mind with regard to God's plan? Were you thinking 
there's a light at the end of the tunnel and I will land somewhere. Obviously you wouldn't have known where it was. And then I'm curious about the timeline, how sure. long before you were arrested with Rabbi Kleinbaum, which was apparently when things got together uh, so, with PDST. Yeah, so for what it's worth, uh, I took a day off from the deli to get arrested. I was at the deli at the time and I was like, hey, I have to get arrested tomorrow. So I'm working at a deli in Lakewood because you know I have uh, kids and things. And um, I, after I was let go from my jobs, um, I was asked to write uh, an article for Keshet for Tuba Shvat. And uh, that year also, like, I think Tuba Shvat came early, uh, the 15th of Shvat, which is the birthday of the trees. And there was like snow out and like the, the trees were like, looked like they were dying. So I wrote this thing about how, where I was in life, that I feel very much like these trees uh, that it's a birthday party, but it looks like people should be delivering eulogies, right? Um, and, and I framed it that uh, I really had faith in the moment. Uh, and I did, it was about a year and a half between, uh, between jobs that I really felt that it was just, it was a function of the next, uh, it was the next season. Meaning that like, just like the tree goes through a process uh, and it's just below the ground and the sap is coming up and then there will be this other season of blooming. I had no doubt. I had no idea what it was going to look like. I had no idea it was, C CBST wasn't on the radar. I had no idea it was going to be C CBST. Uh, but I had no doubt that there would be another side of it. And that other side would be even better than anything I, I could have done in the positions I had before. And, it was, and it's been true. I've been really blessed. Um, but yeah, so I would say it was hard. It was heavy. It was disappointing. It was frustrating. But at no point uh, did I lose hope. Um, and it was that hope that got me through it. And like, I think that's like, when people want to know, like, so like, what's the distinguishing thing that has gotten you to this place? It's just the faith piece has always just been very real for me. And uh, as a result, I'm still here. Um, so I don't know that, that yeah, but uh, yeah. And so that, that article I read, I read and, and, and I'm so blessed to, to really kind of feel like I'm on the other side of it. I feel Baruch Hashem on the other side of it. And now I'm finishing up my third year at CBSD. Um, but yeah, that was uh, three years ago. Uh, in the middle of, uh, of, of the deli, I took a day off. And the next day, like it made national news. And so the next day, uh, not everybody was so happy. But uh, all right, friends, see everybody tomorrow. And uh, we'll continue with the next Mishnah. Always a pleasure. Stay well. Thank you.